Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome Gloria Jacobs, the executive director of the Feminist Press, which is located right here at the City University of New York. The former executive editor of Ms. Magazine was lured to the Feminist Press in 2006 with a mission to reach out to a new group of readers, writers, and activists, and to help the publishing house embrace the new technologies that we can't seem to live without. Welcome. Thank you. Gloria, tell me something about the career path that brought you to the feminist press? I mean, were you interested in writing edit and editing from a, an early age or from college or? Well, I, you know, uh, it's a long story, but I'll make it short. I was always interested in writing. Um, I grew up in a fairly poor working class family and the idea that you could be involved in writing in any way and support yourself was simply, no one could imagine it. Um, so I, became a social worker, um, and um, but quickly realized I was much more interested in journalism and took a long, a long about career path by going to Ethiopia, visit a friend in the Peace Corps, started writing for the Ethiopian Herald. And wow. that was the start of <laughs> how I became a journalist. And you worked at the United Nations for a while? I doing... worked at the United Nations after Ms. Magazine. Um, that was after Ms.? After Ms., yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's go back to Ms. Okay. How did you get to Ms. Magazine? <laughs> um, I got to Ms. because I came back to the States and I was involved in journalism. Um, I was part of a small alternative magazine called Seven Days, and uh, that eventually folded as small alternative magazines to do. do. And um, I was writing for Ms. Magazine and um, at some point just came on staff and, and had a wonderful 11 years there. Now, what years were that? What period of time was uh, that? I think it was 88 to, 88, 6 to 88. I left for a few years, went back in 93. Marsha Gillespie had become the editor-in-chief, and she was someone I adored, adored working with, and, and we were really eager to work together. Okay, so. okay. And from there you came to the Feminist Press. Now, no, what, then what, I did the UN briefly. Then you between. did the UN briefly. Okay. Now, what set you on the feminist path? You know, I think a lot of things. I mean, I mean, at its most basic, I don't see that you can be a woman in this and world not be a, and not right. be a feminist. You know? I agree. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> weirdly, there are some people who aren't, but you know, I, I don't, I don't quite get that either. Yeah, yeah. So it seems easy to me. I mean, mm -hmm. that seemed the obvious place to go. <laughs> now you have, you take. I was reading your bio. You take a very broad view of feminism. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. it's, it's about more than just equality between men and women? I think we've always <laughs> felt, and I think I personally have always felt throughout my career, that you, you can't just be concerned about what's happening to women without understanding that there are many different groups of people who, for one reason or another, are not um, getting their fair share. And if you care about those things for women, you have to care about them for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so um, in academia, it's called intersectionality, but it's, it's the way you bring together race, gender, ethnicity, class, sexual preference, and that all of that is part of creating this world that is much more accepting of people, that is much more concerned about equality, and we want that. Mm -hmm. That's the world we want for everyone. And um, at its most basic, feminism is about men and women, but also at its most basic as well, we're not going to make women's lives different unless we make everyone's right. lives different. You know, it, it was always so amazing to me that the, the people who were so um, outspoken in the, the black civil rights movement, you know, once they sort of got theirs, <coughs> they were unsympathetic to the uh, concerns of feminists, of women, and uh, you know, and then, and also unsympathetic to the concerns of you know gays. You know, that's mm -hmm. our our issue is mm -hmm. more important to that. It's different. You know, it's you know, um, so each each group that that was able to claim long withheld rights then turned against the next group that was trying to get there to get theirs. It's always been interesting to me. The feminist press 
is celebrating its 40th anniversary yeah. this year. Yeah. What was its original mission and has that changed? Uh, its original mission was actually, you know, women's studies was brand new in 1970 when the press started and there was no curricula. There was, you know, what should we be reading? What should we be teaching? What's out there? And nobody knew about it. So the original idea is maybe we'll form a, a kind of curriculum that we can provide to people. At the first meeting, um, someone said, let's do children's books. And I'm actually reading and editing the memoir of Florence Howe now, who's the founder of the press. So I'm at that point where they moved instantaneously from curriculum, and the first book was a children's book that was you know, very gender neutral, um, which is still rare. Um, and then within about a couple of years, Tilly Olson, the writer, came to Florence and said, you know, there are books out there that are out of print, that are classics, that are absolutely essential. And so the press started doing lost women writers, mm -hmm. um, Rebecca Harding Davis, <clears throat> Zora Neale Hurston, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, people who were out of, women who were out of print. Right. Um, I came in, and, and that has gone on for a while. We've gone on, we do works in translation. We do some of the major African-American writers of the 20th century, again, whose works were out of print. I came in really with the mission and the belief that um, all of that is essential, but we should also be doing new works and we should be reaching out to a new audience that is dealing with the world as it is now. And so they, they need to see reflected in our books, the world of feminism and the world of women and men's lives as it exists now. Mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that that readership grows and that we're not just talking to ourselves. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Now you're, I guess, <clears throat> what you would call a nonprofit press. Where does the financing come from? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> is it wherever this we can get it. <laughs> wherever we can get it. We like to say that half of our um, income comes from sales and half from fundraising. This is, you know, right now the economy is so tough. Um, it's sales are difficult and fundraising is difficult yeah. right now. So it's a catch-22 for all the publishers. And as you said in the beginning, we need to be part of the new technologies and that has been my mandate and I've been working on it. But Nobody knows how to make money from ebooks, right? Right. <laughs> you right. know, or what's going to happen? I mean, we're in this huge transitional change, <clears throat> and it's happening to the entire range of media, not just books. Yeah, everybody knows the future's quickly. online, but they don't know how to make money from no, it. No, no. So you're located <clears throat> at CUNY. Does that make you a university press, or what? we like to say we are? Um, at the City University of New York, the feminist press at the City University of New York rather than in the City mm -hmm. University of New York because we're actually independent. Okay. Um, so what is the connection with CUNY? And well, it's a wonderful connection and we're incredibly grateful for it that in return for having our offices here, we put the CUNY name on all of our books. We bring our authors to events here. We work with the Women's Center. We work with the Center for Humanities, the Middle East Center. So that's a, there's a synergy between the kinds of books that we're doing and the, kind, the thinking and the excitement of, of the university as well. So we see it as a perfect blend, but we're not an academic press. We don't do monographs. We don't do dissertations. Okay. Um, do you get support from CUNY? Do you get financial support from CUNY? Or do you get office space from We get CUNY? the office space, okay. and I'm an employee of CUNY. Okay. The rest of the staff is not. Okay. But I am. Okay. Um, what kind of staff do you have? Tiny. <laughs> 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 we're eight people. You know, what I like to say is we're a lot of chiefs. We have one person who is brilliant at what they do in each, quote, department. Right. So we have one publicist one designer, we have an editorial director, and a managing editor who really puts, pushes things through. We have one marketer, one development person, and one office manager. Okay, and you have, you have interns as well, we don't have, you? We have as many interns as we have staff. Do you? And thank God for them, they are incredible. They do everything. Are they, they college students or, or, or out of college? or? Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> I mean, they're generally college students. We try and pull a lot of them from CUNY, and we often have several. Um, as the economy worsens, I see people who have gotten out of school 
who are looking for a job and are interning, you know, as as the first step into right. the publishing industry and in the hopes that they'll find a job. How do you pick your titles? Now, when you, uh, in, in the commercial publishing world, you know, you have an author who writes a proposal, gives it to an agent, the agent shops it around to different editors at publishing houses, it goes before a committee at the publishing house, the committee decides, they pay you in advance, <laughs> Uh, you know, or half the advance, right. you know, at the time of signing and then the other half at the time that you deliver the manuscript. Does, does, is, is it a similar process or is it different at the Feminist Press? And you've been through this, right? That's how you know. I didn't get very far, but hopefully I'll get farther the next time. But anyway. It is like that. It is like that. Um, we do in advance. We, um, you know, people shop proposals to us. We don't get as many from agents because the agents know our rates are very low. Um, although the rest, the rest of the industry is starting to match us, mm -hmm. you know, right now. Um, but we also, you know, the editorial director, Amy Shoulder, and I are out there all the time. We're meeting with people. We go to places where writers congregate. We talk about the press. And so people know about us, know what we're looking for, and come to us. Um, we give a small advance, half up front, half on publication. Mm -hmm. um, we do a decent... Um, royalty payment, and, and we try and get our authors out there and get a lot of publicity for them. Do you also go after authors as opposed to having authors come to you? Do you we do. Uh -huh. We do. I mean, we're publishing right now Taslima Nazreen, who is a Bangladeshi author who was exiled from Bangladesh because her works were too feminist and too political. And um, it, I had written about her in Ms. when the fatwa was first declared against her in 93 or 94, and she was forced into exile. And I've sort of had my eye on her all these years, and suddenly here I was at the feminist press, and I thought, this is who I'd really mm -hmm. like to publish. And I, I did. I went after her and found her, and she was right here in New York teaching at NYU. And... Um, we're doing her book with a translation by Honor Moore, so okay. it's a wonderful. Who wonderful. I've also had on the show. I mm. loved her book about her father. Right. We're right. going to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more with Gloria Jacobs, the executive director of the Feminist Press, after the following messages. I'm lucky. Let me help you with that. I get to do something I love. It has nothing to do with touchdowns or titles. Everybody bring it in. I get to play a part in the life of someone just starting out. How many of you think homework is just as important as teamwork? I help keep kids in school. Good. And that's the name of the game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Give, advocate, volunteer, live united. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Gloria Jacobs, the executive director of the Feminist Press. So how many titles do you publish in a year? We publish about 20, um, which means sometimes two a month, sometimes one a month. Um, it's hard right now. On, on the one hand, you want to be out there, you want people to see your books, but it, it's very tight. So I'm actually considering, should we do less? Should we maybe even do more, or just get more out there? Mm -hmm. so. so tell me about um, some of your forthcoming, your authors and books that are yeah. coming out soon. Yeah, we have some amazing books, I must say. We have a memoir by Reiko Rizzuto, um, who is a Japanese-American who, in September 2001, was in Hiroshima interviewing survivors of the atomic bomb attack. And of course, the attacks on New York happened at the same time. And her family was here, and she couldn't reach them. And um, so it's this very powerful moving back and forth, you know, and looking at the effects of, of these kinds of attacks on people and what it means to be a survivor and how one copes. And it's it's really quite, quite moving. She won an American Book Award about 10 years ago for a book that she brought out. And so we're absolutely thrilled to have her. Um, we also have a book by an Israeli author, Michal Goverin, um, Essays and Short Stories. She has just been declared by the Salon de Livre in Paris, one of the top 30 writers in the world for the past 30 years because the Salon de Livre is celebrating its 30th anniversary. And 
she's in there with Salman Rushdie and people like that. Mm -hmm. So we are <clears throat> thrilled to have her as well. Um, they're very surreal stories in a lot of ways, and, and but very, very powerful. I notice you're republishing June Jordan's His Own Where. Yes. Which I remember. Right here, yeah. This just came out. It's, um, it's an extraordinary book. And, and as you see, it's been introduced by Sapphire. It's this beautiful, short, young adult novel. It was, I believe, the first young adult novel that June wrote. And um, it was the first writ book written all in black English. Right, right. <clears throat> and it's the story of these two kids on the streets of New York trying to save themselves and, and love is what saves them. And, and so it's both very harsh in a lot of ways and yet very, very beautiful and very moving. You have a book coming out from Medea to Michelle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that one. Um, that is a <clears throat> wonderful young blogger, uh, Courtney Martin, and Courtney Young, I'm sorry. And um, she's looking at the, the sort of two sides of this image of black women in popular culture right now, where you have Tyler Perry's Medea, who is, you know, overweight, conservative, traditional in many ways. And then you have this image of Michelle Obama as powerful, um, independent, you know, really smart, and, and not feeling that she has to inhabit a traditional role, perhaps, of what black women might be. And um, the excitement around that and what it means and how images change because of that. And, and yet, to some extent, why Tyler Perry is still dealing in this right. very, very traditional image that's often demeaning. Um, and, and so she's really tackling all Interesting. of that. Interesting. So it's Madea, not Madea. Okay. <laughs> right. Yes, right. Sorry. <laughs> And you have a book, and I was intrigued by the title of uh, another book, The, Ma the Madame Curie Complex. Right. What is The Madame Curie Complex? The Madame Curie Complex is one we all know well if we're a woman. It's how you have to do so much better than a man to be noticed. Um, and that you also have to have other qualities that when Madame Curie came to New the States and was traveling around, it was about how charming she was or, you know, how interesting to talk to, and it wasn't about her research half right, of the time. Right. Um, but what this book also talks about is because women are viewed differently in the world, because they grow up differently than men and the way they're treated, they bring a different set of expectations into the laboratory and, and into doing science. And therefore, what they discover and how they do research um, is often unique and really important. And so it's that idea, once again, that you you can't afford to do anything without having the, half the world, you right. know, making sure that they're there. What percentage of your books are fiction versus nonfiction? You know, I don't deal in percentages in the sense of thinking about what are we going to do. Um, I will say right now nonfiction sells much better than fiction, mm -hmm. and so we have to really think about with the fiction we're publishing and how we will do with it. Um, I think traditionally we did more fiction than nonfiction and it's, it's slowly changing, but I'm, fiction is absolutely something, I only read fiction pretty much. Really? Okay. I, so you you'll know, always do some fiction. I read our fiction. books, but right, you right. know, um, I, I feel it's really important to nurture fiction writers, to nurture new fiction writers, and that will always be part of what we do. These days, do your books have a particular focus? I mean, on social issues or immigration or gay rights or just across the board or, or just I, whatever good books come your way? Kind of the latter, <clears throat> but with a little bit more shape to it than that, in that I do think it's our message is that all of this is feminism and it's funny and it's sad and it's surprising in all sorts of different ways. And so it's really important to us to have a broad range of works. So it, it covers everything. And what men. <laughs> we publish men. You do? Yeah. OK, yeah. like for instance? Well, we have a book coming out in this fall um, by Josh McPhee. It's um, Posters of the Revolution. And he has commissioned artists to look at people's movements that are not well known, that again fits in with our mission to look at social justice issues. Um, a lot of them led by women. So it's an art book. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what have been your best sellers over the years? What kinds of books? One of our biggest best sellers, and it's one I'm really proud of, um, is Baghdad Burning, based on the blog by Riverbend, who's a young woman in Iraq who started writing about the inv invasion in 2003 and um, found herself unable to leave the house, uh, lost her job because as a woman they wanted her, first of all they wanted her to appear in a burqa and then they just didn't want her to come to work. And so she started blogging from home and it's been an incredible bestseller for us. Another one is Witches, Midwives and Nurses by Barbara Ehrenreich and Deirdre English. Um, about how women as healers in, in the Middle Ages were in the end classified as witches and men took over women's health care. And it's still relevant. It's a huge bestseller and they've just in, done a new introduction for our 40th anniversary that we're bringing out in July. But, but also another uh, book by Barbara Ehrenreich too was one of your bestsellers. I mean, there's several, right? Yeah, two. Complaints <clears throat> and Disorders is the other one, which is a follow-up to Witches, Midwives, and Nurses. And it's a look at, at mm -hmm. the medical establishment and women. I had heard that you were working with the chancellor of CUNY to focus on the issue of women in science. Is that, am I correct on that? Yes, we have um, a grant from the National Science Foundation to encourage women to enter scientific fields and to stay there by using books and literature. And so the Madame Curie Complex is one of the books in that series. Um, we also have a website under the microscope that's just devoted to women in science. And now we're working, um, actually Vice Chancellor Jillian Small is coordinating it, a women in science symposium that will be here at the Graduate Center in September. And we're going to bring women from all over the country and to speak and we'll have people from all over the city of New York mm -hmm. attending. Now I know you have a board. Does the, does the board are they more advisory? I mean, do they? Do you have a board that votes on which titles you're going to publish, or how does that work? No, <clears throat> we've always felt that um, once you start publishing by committee, you you won't ever have anything that's really exciting mm -hmm. and innovative. It's just too hard to please everyone. So our board really serves as advisory in the sense of helping us think about financing, helping us think about areas where we should be publishing in. You know, like. The science idea came from one of our board members, but um, the final decision rests with us. With the, with the editors. Yeah. What are you doing in terms of, you know, embracing the new technology? What, what are you... Ch <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is all I think about. Um, I've just been asked to be on a panel about it 10 months from now, and I, I can't even imagine how it will change in 10 months. Um, we are on Kindle, we're on the Nook, we're on Sony e-reader, we're about to go on the iPad. Um, all of our new books come out as e-books when they're published. Uh, but the issues that I really think about are what will it mean? What, what does it mean for a staff that is built around the idea of publishing a real book? If you're suddenly publishing mainly ebooks and nobody knows when that transition will happen but everyone seems to think it will happen um, and so it's it's very much about I, I feel like you know it's trite but Gutenberg's Bible you know the, the world is shifting underneath our feet and and we have to think very hard about it we are you know on Facebook we are tweeting we're making sure that we're out there in that electronic marketplace. Um, but I hope there will always be a niche for paper books. Mm -hmm. I think there will. I think it's finding that balance is what we have to do in the next year or so. Do you have a, 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 a wish list? And if so, what's on it? For books or, or, or for, <laughs> well, <laughs> for, for the everything. press, for, yes, for, yes, <laughs> yes. for the um, for books. I think yeah. My my wish list is that we um, will continue to thrive. You know, I mean, this is an industry that is in huge upheaval, and I think what we're doing is so important. So at its most basic, it's you know, this has to continue, and and we need to reach out to the people who will help us continue and to do the wonderful books that we've always done. Mm -hmm. is, a pu is a publishing industry in as, in as big an upheaval as a journalism industry? Absolutely. Is? Really? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just completely changing. There are 
layoffs all over the industry as everyone sort of constricts and book sales, not, or, not across the board, but for a lot of people, book sales are dropping and, mm -hmm. and you know, it's hard to see. It's not, the difference is not being made up yet by eBooks. Right, and, right. So, so it's hard to know just what the future is going to mm -hmm. be like. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask you about how Ms. Magazine is doing, but we're out of time, so I'll have to ask you that after we, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> after we wrap up. Uh, my, my thanks to Gloria Jacobs, the executive director of the Feminist Press, which is here at the City University of New York. If you'd like more information about the Feminist Press and want to scan the latest book list, go to feministpress.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>